Imagine this. There's a corner of the moon so dark that sunlight has literally never touched it in billions of years. Temperatures plummet to minus 230 degrees Celsius or colder. And hiding in that eternal freeze is something we're absolutely desperate for if humanity wants to live and work in space long term. Water ice. For a long time, we thought the moon was bone dry. The Apollo astronauts came back with rocks that looked completely dehydrated. Any tiny hint of water was written off as contamination from Earth. That story held until the mid-1990s when two missions started rewriting the textbooks. First, NASA's Clementine spacecraft in 1994 used radar to bounce signals off the lunar south pole and found evidence of permanently shadowed regions, craters so deep and so perfectly positioned that the sun's rays never reached their floors. In those shadows, any water that arrived billions of years ago could still be frozen solid today. Then, in 1998, Lunar Prospector flew over the poles and its neutron spectrometer picked up a strong hydrogen signal. Hydrogen by itself isn't water, but in a cold trap, it's a smoking gun. Scientists started doing the math. If that hydrogen is bound up in H2O, we might be looking at hundreds of millions of tons of ice. Japan tried the direct approach in 2009. Their Kaguya spacecraft deliberately crashed near the South Pole, hoping to kick up a plume that telescopes on Earth could analyze. Result? Nothing definitive. A swing and a miss. But India and NASA weren't giving up. In 2008 to 2009, Chandrayaan-1 carried NASA's Moon Mineralogy Mapper, M-cubed, an imaging spectrometer that finally saw the unmistakable absorption features of water molecules and hydroxyl, OH, across wide swaths of the sunlit moon. A few months later, NASA's L-Cross mission took the sledgehammer approach. They slammed a spent Centaur upper stage into Cabeus Crater at 9,000 kilometers per hour. The shepherding spacecraft flew through the debris cloud and its near-infrared spectrometer confirmed water, about 5.6% by mass in the ejected material, along with other volatiles like ammonia and even silver. That was the no-doubt-about-it moment. Today, the best estimates based on Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter's LEND neutron data, Lyman Alpha Mapping Project, LAMP, UV measurements, and radar from MINI-RF, put the total accessible ice in the South Polar region at roughly 600 million metric tons, give or take a factor of two. That's still an insane amount. Enough to fill about 240,000 Olympic swimming pools. But here's what's wild. The moon also has a tiny, flickering water cycle even in sunlight. LRO's Diviner Radiometer and the Lunar Exploration Neutron Detector have shown that surface hydration waxes and wanes with temperature. Water molecules hop around at dawn, get liberated by micrometeorite impacts or solar wind sputtering, then cold trap back into the soil at night. It's not a river, but it's a dynamic reservoir we didn't expect. So where did all this water come from in the first place? Three main delivery services. One, comets, dirty snowballs that slammed into the moon early in solar system history and left their ice behind. Two, solar wind. Protons streaming from the sun hit oxygen-rich minerals in the regolith, forming hydroxyl that can later combine into H2O. This process has been lab verified with Apollo samples. Three, volcanic outgassing billions of years ago. Some of that ancient water is still trapped inside glass beads created when lava fountains cooled rapidly. And yes, in 2020, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, SOFIA, confirmed water locked in sunlit soils at concentrations of 100 to 400 parts per million equivalent to about one bottle of water per cubic meter of soil 
in places like Clavius Crater. It's not a lake, but if you process a ton of regolith, you can extract a liter or two of drinkable water. Why does any of this matter? Because water in space is the ultimate multi-tool. You drink it. You split it into oxygen to breathe and hydrogen to burn with that oxygen as rocket propellant. One kilogram of water gives you roughly 500 grams of O2 and enough H2 to produce the same delta V that costs $10,000 to $20,000 to launch from Earth. The Moon's gravity is one-sixth of Earth's and there's no atmosphere to fight. So escaping lunar gravity with locally made propellant changes the entire economic equation of deep space travel. That's why every major space agency and a growing list of private players are racing to the lunar South Pole. NASA's Artemis program, China's Chang'e program, Roscosmos, ISRO, and companies like iSpace, Astrobotic, Intuitive Machines. They all want permanent footholds near peaks of eternal light, ridges that get almost constant sunlight for solar power, right next to craters of eternal darkness full of ice. But the South Pole is legitimately the most hostile real estate we've ever tried to work in. First problem, electrostatic charging. The moon has no magnetic field and no atmosphere, so solar wind and UV radiation hit the surface directly. In permanently shadowed regions, photoelectrons can't escape easily, leading to huge negative charges on crater floors while sunlit rims go strongly positive. Models published in geophysical research letters suggest potential differences of hundreds of kilovolts over just tens of meters, enough to arc and fry electronics or even injure an astronaut. Second problem, regolith. Lunar dust is finer than talcum powder and sharpened into glass shards by micrometeorite impacts. It's electrostatically clingy and highly abrasive. Apollo astronauts called it lunar hay fever. In shadowed regions where there's no solar UV to bleed off charge, dust levitates more aggressively. One grain in your lungs is bad. A cloud of charged dust welding itself to your visor is catastrophic. Third problem, thermal extremes. Chandrayaan 3's chast instrument measured a drop from plus 60 degrees Celsius on the surface to minus 10 degrees Celsius just eight centimeters down, one of the steepest thermal gradients ever recorded on a planetary body. Your hardware has to survive that swing every lunar day, which lasts 29 Earth days. And then real life kicks in. NASA's Viper rover, the Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration rover, was fully built and ready to prospect the South Pole in 2024 but cost overruns and delays forced cancellation in July 2024, a huge setback. South Korea's Danuri orbiter with NASA's shadow cam has taken the highest resolution images ever of Shackleton Crater, and it looks disappointingly dry on the surface. India's Pragyan rover in 2023 found sulfur, titanium, aluminum, iron, Everything except the hydrogen signature we were hoping for. So is the ice a myth? Absolutely not. Orbital neutron, radar, and UV data still scream, water ice is there. The emerging consensus is that the top few centimeters are desiccated by radiation and thermal cycling. And the good stuff starts 10 to 50 centimeters down, mixed heterogeneously in the regolith. Future landers will need drills, not just surface scoops. That's why the next few years are make or break. NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services, CLPS, program has multiple ice hunting missions coming. One, Intuitive Machines Prime One Drill and Mass Spectrometer, 2026 target. Two, Lunar Trailblazer Orbiter 3, the Chinese-Russian International Lunar Research Station plans four, 
Artemis human landings no earlier than 2028. We're transitioning from, is there water? To, how do we reliably mine and process it at scale? Beyond water, the lunar regolith contains roughly 45% oxygen by mass bound in oxides, plus iron, titanium, aluminum, and trace helium-3. A potential fuel for future fusion reactors, though fusion power is still decades away. Rare earth elements are present in creep-rich terrains. Potassium, rare earth elements, phosphorus. At concentrations comparable to or higher than some terrestrial ores. Mining them on the moon avoids the toxic tailings and radioactive thorium issues that plague Earth-based extraction. Legally, the 1967 Outer Space Treaty says no one can claim sovereignty over the moon, but it's silent on resource rights. The 2020 Artemis Accords try to create norms for safety zones and resource utilization, but China and Russia have refused to sign. We're heading into a period where the first entities to demonstrate in situ resource utilization, ISRU, will set de facto standards. So here is the conclusion. The moon isn't just a romantic silver orb anymore. It's the closest, richest off-world resource depot we have. The South Pole, with its peaks of near constant sunlight and nearby craters full of ice, is the Abu Dhabi of the inner solar system. Getting there, surviving there, and turning lunar dirt into water, air, and rocket fuel is the hardest engineering challenge we've tackled since Apollo. But if we crack it, we don't just go back to the moon, we stay. And from there, Mars, the asteroids, and the rest of the solar system suddenly look a whole lot closer.